Hello, everyone, um, and thank you so much for being here this lovely afternoon. Um, so I am uh, Rachel Copeland, and I work at Boswell Book Company as a bookseller. Today is day 5,264 of Boswell being in business. So our author of the afternoon is Louise Hare. She's the uh, London-based author of Miss Aldridge Regrets. Her debut novel, This Lovely City, was published uh, to wide acclaim and was a Between the Covers book club pick on BBC Two. She has an MA in creative writing uh, from the University of Lond London. Thank you so much for being here this afternoon, Louise. Thank you for having me. <laughs> And um, so we were just chatting a little bit beforehand about, you know, how you're in the UK, I'm in the US, and it it occurs to me um, that it's thematically perfect for this particular book series that we're discussing today. Uh, so we're talking about uh, both books, I would say, uh, we're celebrating the release of Harlem After Midnight, um, which is the follow-up to Miss Aldridge Regrets. And it's a series that follows um, Lena Aldridge. And um, would you please, just as a sort of beginning intro, would you sort of give us a little overview of this Canary Club mystery series? Yes. Um, so, so the Canary Club, just to explain the name of the series, uh, it's kind of this, um, it's a nightclub in Soho in London, uh, which is a little bit, grimy not as you know sort of swankiest nightclub in the world um and my heroine lena aldridge is working there she's a jazz singer um she had all these great aspirations that she was going to be on the western stage and have this you know incredible glittering career and that hasn't happened she's ended up stuck in this sort of dingy nightclub um so that's where she is when we, we first meet her in miss aldridge regrets um but she kind of get offers this amazing opportunity that sounds too good to be true, um, which is a role on in a Broadway musical and a first class ticket on the Queen Mary that will take her to New York. Um, because she doesn't really have anything to lose, or so she thinks, she's like, well, let's just do it. The ticket is real. I've got my passport. Let's go. Um, and but then when she gets on the ship, the murders start to happen, and she realizes there's something going on. She's somehow got involved in uh this you know very tricky situation um so yeah that's the that's the sort of the first book and then Harlem After Midnight is sort of what happens uh, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that she does survive <laughs> uh, in the end um and then Harlem After Midnight is obviously what happens then when she gets to New York mm -hmm. and I love the um uh yeah like so we we start sort of in the UK, we're not really in the UK in the first book because of course she's on an ocean liner for most of the story, but um, it does kind of feel like we have this um, across the pond um, uh, atmosphere, right? In the first book, it feels British. And then the second book feels very like she's a fish out of water in the US. Um, so you of course are a historian, I believe, like you are, um, you work with, is it sorry uh the quill magic quill or <laughs> <laughs> yes okay so I sort of choose the historical fiction writers yeah yes 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 so um so you're you're pretty well versed in um, historical research and whatnot um so how fun was it for you to uh delve into this research into Harlem specifically in 1936 yeah it was really interesting um I mean one of the issues I created for myself was that I hadn't sort of realized, you know, being British, uh, I, I've been to New York several times, but I haven't really thought about the history before. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was sort of looking at Harlem thinking, okay, I just need to research Harlem. But of course, because there's a sort of dual timeline. So you've yes. got Lena's mystery, present day mystery, which is happening in 1936. Then this is other timeline that follows her father when he was living in New York, um, sort of 30 or so years earlier. And New York completely changed in in, the, in that. So I was like, oh my gosh, I've got to do like two lots of research. Because yeah. So yeah, it was really interesting, but a lot of work, <laughs> a lot more work than I had originally envisaged. 
but like a lot of fun um i mean because lena's there in the 30s so it's a little bit after the harlem renaissance but you know visit revisiting those authors um that i maybe haven't read for a while and sort of getting mm-hmm. into that um getting into the vibe i always like to get into the vibe of a period before i start writing and sort of think about um the people that were living in that area at that time and and what were their daily lives and and see what i can take from that and put into my my own fiction and getting into the vibe of historical fiction in general every time i read anything set in any time period doesn't matter my first uh way in is fashion personally because i do a lot of sewing in my free time i make a lot of my own clothing um so that's always my first focus and I you know it goes over my head if it's I don't know horseback riding or something else so what's your sort of um way into a historical period what do you focus on first um so the novels I start with the novels but novels that were Mm. written at the time because I love obviously historical fiction so stuff that's written now about the period Mm -hmm. what I'm always looking for is the language because I feel like the language that people wrote in at the time is always different to how we write now. Um, and so I, I always find that fascinating. Um, and especially the fiction that was published around the turn of the century. So looking at the period when Alfie was in New York, like 1908, and looking at the African, African-American authors who were writing fiction then and how they wrote and described things was really interesting. Um, and then photographs. So finding mm-hmm. images of the streets and I guess like the fashion seeing what people were wearing and um how they were traveling and all that kind of thing because obviously New York as well had the elevated trains at that point so mm-hmm. um yeah I mean it was so fun like sending the draft to my editor he's based in New York and she was like oh, elevated trains here like she she didn't even know <laughs> um right so, yeah I was like yes I found out something and New York I didn't know <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I did, I mean, I totally forgot that, um, because like all of my sort of knowledge of like the Harlem Renaissance and whatnot, sadly, mostly comes from like my college (laughs) experience. And then since I've gone on to um, research other things, but um, I had totally not realized um, that like, I guess, before Harlem was really the the place, um, you had what the Tenderloin and Tin Pan Alley, and those were the two the sort of areas where Alfie ended up in 1908 in this book. Um, so d- uh, like pictures wise, are there like existing pictures of these places? Because I imagine they've changed quite a bit since then. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, li- I did have to go to the library and get mm-hmm. out and sort of look through. Um, I mean, thank goodness for the internet. Google is one of my best yes. friends. When it comes to images because at least with the image you can see the, the, the random things you find that are written not always but yeah just finding these really cool cool pictures of people and i think because sort of 1908 you had like the great migration when black people were sort of leaving the southern states and trying to make new lives in new york so there's quite good documentation because it's such an important part of african-american mm-hmm. history really easy to find information so that was a blessing um so be a uh, found some like wonderful stuff good um so just in general i i have to say um for those of you who haven't actually read the series yet or interested in in reading it um the ending of this book and then into this book i'm so impressed with how you were able to not spoil anything in this book when reading uh, when I was reading Harlem After Midnight was uh, how difficult was that for you and did you have to go back to maybe remove uh, information yeah I mean the the first draft of Harlem After Midnight was really tricky because I'd never written a sequel before I've written standalone books I've never (laughs) done a series before so it was how much does, do people need to know? Like, do I need to remind people of stuff? But then you also, people want to be able to read it if they haven't read the first book. So I was kind of thinking, okay. So yeah, it was a lot of writing the first, maybe eight chapters over and over and going through and thinking, do I need that? 
or you know so basically what it came down to was making as little mention of the first book as I could get away with so that I didn't spoil the because actually the characters a lot of the characters didn't need to be in the second book Mm -hmm. the first book is a is a full story that has an ending so it, it was like okay well I have two characters that need to be in this because they're together at the end of the end of the first book but then I think there's one other character that, that pops up and that's it. And everyone else is, is brand new, brand new story. So um, so I try to keep it to that as, as much as possible. There's a little bit in there because obviously I have to explain about Alfie and um, mm. his father who's in, he's, he's dead. <laughs> he's dead in the yeah. first place. So he's there as a sort of memory. Um, but now he has his own timeline because it was something that I was really interested in was finding out who this guy was. Absolutely. And I really love the idea that um, we almost have with these two books, two completely different subgenres in mystery series. Like the, the ocean liner mystery is definitely its own thing. And I can point, I can like name several titles in like other mystery series or just standalones that are, you know, set on ocean liners and then in this book um we have uh, i would i would actually find it difficult to characterize what i would call this as a subgenre of mystery but she's definitely this sort of fish out of water in um harlem after midnight uh, completely alone except for the kindness of virtual strangers um which i think gives you a lot of room to do whatever you like and what you do with this is you create the sort of like tangled web <laughs> for for Lena. So um, talk to me a little bit about, um, I don't, try not to spoil anything. Um, talk to me a little bit about how you created this new cast of characters that Lena had to navigate her way through in Harlem After Midnight. So I knew that I wanted, um, what was it? At the end of the first book, with Lena and there's Will, who is the sort of romance interest of the first book. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I mean, I mean, everyone loved Will. Like, yes. every event I did for the first book, I was like, oh, Will. So I was like, Dreamy. Yeah, exactly. And he's at the end of the, the first book. So I'm like, okay, well, he needs to stay. Um, And so, yeah. And then, so then you've got his friends that she's staying mm-hmm. with. Uh, but then I was like, well, Will, Will needs to have some secrets of his own. Um, so one of his, well, it's not really secret, is that he has a stepsister and they have a very turbulent relationship, shall we say. So I guess the the way that I drew this cast of characters around Lena was, mm-hmm. who can she trust? And it turns out no one. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. So yeah, so my, so my main goal was just to surround her by people that she couldn't trust. Mm-hmm. Um, some of them are more trustworthy than others like you kind of don't know because she doesn't know and it's only as things as events start to unfold that you start to work out who has ulterior motives for certain things and who is actually you know i don't maybe just had a sort of dodgy look at her one time and then she's like oh (laughs) yeah (laughs) yes you never know um well and in that um one of the you know people in this web of possible uh, enemies or friends we have uh bell bennett who is uh will's stepsister he just calls her a sister sometimes um and she's very interesting to me because i i read in an interview you said you sort of wanted her to be like the femme fatale but without the male gaze part of it and um i think what you created and correct me if i'm wrong but it feels like she's um if not lena's foil um sort of like a funhouse mirror version of lena like what she could be if things had gone differently for her um so is that what was that your thought process for creating bell who was such a huge part of the story yeah i mean ex- yeah exactly that you know she's i mean lena's sort of drawn to her because they have so much in common mm-hmm. in in terms of you know they both work in sort of clubs and and things even though Belle's not a singer um and Lena knows that 
she could have ended up like Belle, which is that Belle's a single mother with not very much money and um sort of feels like you know, I guess like Lily did in the first, but life is slipping past her and she doesn't know how to take control of things. Um, so yeah, she's got a lot of a lot in common with Lena. And then I guess this the start point for creating Belle was because you know, I love Passing by Nella Larson, such a classic mm. book. Because um Lena is passing, and you know, obviously that that the whole thing with, with the book passing is you've got these two women who are sort of friends. But they're also sort of not friends because they're sort of competing in certain ways and they're both passing, but they've chosen different paths. One has chosen to embed herself in her community and the other one has chosen to basically pass herself off as white and marry uh, a man who's very racist. And, you mm-hmm. know, so I kind of, so Bal was kind of not supposed to be a copy of that character because, I mean, the way she's gone about things is, is very different, but she was sort of supposed to be this other half of the couple of the couple of the options, I guess, the two options that you have. Um right. so so yeah, so she was very she was probably the most interesting new character to write in this book because she's so complex and uh yeah, I mean her and Lena aren't really friends, they're sort of more like frenemies. Um mm-hmm. I wanted that kind of vibe with with them too. It was kind of fun to write scenes. Yeah. Like yeah, because it's really, and you can see Lena um, sort of comparing her self to Belle and uh, really kind of almost, uh, I don't know, reassessing herself in a certain way and being like, is that what I'm like? Or um, So it's really interesting whenever a character comes across somebody who's like, wow, they're too similar to me. <laughs> um, so, yes, a very integral part of both of these books is the idea that Lena is passing, does pass, can pass, and um, often is put in the position of having to choose whether or not to sort of reveal her true self, to um, stick up for, you know, like her father, for instance. Um, It's a very important part of the story was it a did it just come naturally to force her in the position of doing this constantly because her sort of chosen career path is literally being on stage and you know in the spotlight at times um because she's she's always having to choose yeah i mean it was it was something that i when i was writing soldier's regrets and i was thinking about the character um, I mean, the main reason I made her biracial but able to pass was because it, I mean, I started writing that book back in 2019. So in the UK, there was just so much stuff in all the, all the tabloid papers about Meghan Markle. And I remember someone saying to me, but it's not racist because she basically looks white. And I was like, well, that's not how racism works. But anyway, um, so I kind of wanted to use Lena to have those conversations and show like why someone who looks like Lena will still be um discriminated against I mean yes she can pass but then also I guess this is why Alfie became such a big part of the first book even though he's like dead <laughs> like he's <laughs> basically there um and why I wanted to bring him in more in in Harlem After Midnight was because it was just a, he's just a great way of exploring her exploring her identity because you know he couldn't pass she can well what does she, what does she lose by passing i guess because in the mm-hmm. first book will knows that she's not who, how she's presenting herself and that actually bonds them together and so i was quite interested when she got to an environment where she could be free to just be honest like would she would she do that you know, most of the time, obviously, she does, but then it's kind of like Belle is always taking her to places where she kind of has to pass, and that, that I found that interesting as well. Like Belle being that sort of devil on her shoulder, going, "Well, we can go here, just we can't take Will, but we can go," um, and almost sort of trying to drive that wedge between her and Will as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's uh, another thing I love about the inclusion of Belle as a character is that she's sort of um, trying to. 
I th- she's she's her Lena's intrusive thoughts almost. She's like, "What if we did the? What if we did the bad thing? You know, is it really such a bad thing if we? You know, um, but the specter of Alfie. I think it's important to keep Alfie in the mix in the story, and he's you know literally as you know a side plot or you know a, another plot in the story is." Um, you know, the result of his life and him not being able to pass and him having to make the hard choices and having hard choices made upon him um, because his his life was just inherently harder. Um, so I love that part of the story. I think um, it's, you know, it's a better book because we get to see Alfie's story as well. Um, and it really gives me, uh, it, it makes me really interested too in this idea that we can't run away from our past. It feels like that's um, like a major theme in this story because Lena is literally running away in, uh, in the first book. And then she's kind of entertaining this notion of maybe I can stay away forever in the second book. Um, so yeah, is this something that do you think will continue for Lena as a character? Um, this idea that she, she's running from her past. Um, do you think she'll, she would ever be able to find like a equilibrium? I don't know. I mean, it's interesting because it's like when I was figuring out who she was, because she's, uh, 26. (laughs) Um, mm. and so I was thinking about when I was that age and just so I just felt so directionless like I didn't know what I wanted to do in my life I was just sort of you know I had a job but I was just earning money just enough money to pay rent and things um, so it was not in anywhere near as bad a situation as Lena is but you know I kind of know what it feels like we like like when is something going to get better when when like when is someone going to offer me an opportunity or when is something going to come out that I can just push for and and aim for and so that was that was always that was kind of her starting point was someone whose life's a bit of a mess and she doesn't know what yeah. to do so so basically in both books she's kind of just in this situation doesn't really know what to do is just kind of trying to figure out a way out of the thing that's happening to her in this in this moment um so and I kind of like I kind of like that <laughs> so I think like a third book would be similar like her just sort of running around going ah like I don't know what to do <laughs> let me go and do this okay let me try and solve it this way I don't know right <laughs> um so it's kind of fun to write and because mm-hmm. I don't really plot <laughs> I mean I'm literally a little bit directionless as I'm writing her so I'm just like let's just put you here okay cool. um so so yeah but I kind of just I just kind of like that that it's, I don't know, it's just, it was just like my whole mid to late 20s was that. <laughs> and so I feel like as long as she's that age, then yeah, that's going to be how she feels about things. Yeah. Well, it's incredibly relatable. My Me at 26 is not me at uh, 35 now. So it's, it's really exciting to think about just in general, any character that I enjoy um, just continuing to evolve and grow so um just in general i cannot wait to see you know what else happens with lena but on the topic of how old she is now but then also just in general this timeline it struck me when i was rereading these books that this takes place over less than i think like a month of time all told (laughs) between the like the first book is what sort of three days really yeah because it's literally the crossing yeah with uh, with our flashbacks being the week prior and then in this book we maybe cover um just a few weeks uh which is exciting do you um i guess you know i was going to ask you about like timelines and stuff like that but i realize if you're a pantser you're probably going to continue to to do whatever you want with <laughs> with timelines in the future um, but in general, is that something that you enjoy the like keeping it in a um a bubble of time? Or would you ever consider um doing a more drawn out story, I guess? Yeah. 
Um, I think I think with these two books, it was kind of compressed because because there were always like time constraints. So obviously she's on a she's on a ship. Well, the ship's only gonna because I obviously I went and did research and I looked at the crossings for the Queen Mary, and so I picked the dates of an actual crossing. So then I had like four days. And then the other things that happened in London before were quite fast moving. So they had to happen quite close to that. Mm. Because I didn't, there were things that she couldn't find out before. So that was kind of like how that book happened. And then similar with Harlem After Midnight, there were, because she has a ticket book to go back to the UK. Mm. Basically she's like in two minds whether to sort of cash it in and get a refund. But because I had those two weeks, I was like, well, okay, this needs to happen within those two weeks. And then the decision needs to be made mm-hmm. by that time. So so again, I had those that sort of time constraint. Um, and in some ways, it's kind of easy because you can sort of, as much as I don't plot, you know you're running out of time. So you have to like think, okay, well, by this day, something like this needs to have happened. So you can do like a vague thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but my very first book, um, which is a standalone called This Lovely City. I think it takes, I think, again, it's, there's two timelines, but I think that takes place over sort of, sort of a few months. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, I'm open to, I guess I'm open to wherever the story takes me in terms yeah. of timelines and, and how long, yeah. Fair enough. And I think also it would be interesting to explore, uh, you know, again, sort of like as a genre, um, like one of my favorite series is the the expanse series which is completely unrelated to this but you know i love how you know even though it's a sci-fi series they you know they do one book that's set on basically it's a you know a space ocean liner and then another book that's got like 20 perspective characters i love that that freedom to explore um but yeah so we we don't want to ask too much about a possible third book, but I'm I'm very much in hopes that we will see another um, book after this. I wanted to ask you, because this has been on my mind, it's called the Canary Club uh, mystery series. We barely see the Canary Club. Was that an intentional um, idea on your part? Um, when did it become... Uh, you know, a Canary Club mystery, and will we ever see more of it? Well, um, I mean, partly it's the publisher kind of <laughs> wanting to give it a name, um, and they didn't like Billy Not Aldridge mysteries because they were like kind of a bit too. Uh, um, so I came up with the Canary Club because I guess the Soldier's Regrets originally started as a short story that I wrote when I was doing my MA. And it was all set within this club called the Canary Club. So it all kind of started even before Lena was Lena, the Canary Club was there. So I kind of liked it as sort of an origin story kind of thing. Um, but I do envisage Lena going back to the Canary Club because because actually that's one thread that isn't quite tied up after the first mm-hmm. two books. So I do think she does need to go back if there are future installments. It almost builds it up as like, um... <laughs> a weird way to put it, but like a sort of, you know, the final boss battle or like the the unseen character. Um, I just love the idea that it's almost like a specter for her. It's um, a place she has very complicated feelings about. Um, and in the both of the books, you also, um, you know, adding to those complicated feelings, we have uh, this whole backstory with Lena and her best friend Maggie, for instance. Um, So, yeah, and, oh, I just, everything I want to ask you is a spoiler. (laughs) Can I just say? It's so hard to talk about a mystery series. All right, I'm just going to, I'm going to wipe that out of my head. I don't want to ask about that. So um, going back to history, because this is a safe ground for us, um, I know you're actively involved in the historical fiction world. Um, What references? You make some very fun specific references in this book to you know 1936 Harlem what reverence are you most proud of in this book uh Ella Fitzgerald is singing in this book mm-hmm. uh, I like I, I like because I actually managed to find out that she was singing in a club I was already, already going to write this scene it was already on this date 
and it turned out it was the opening of the Savoy um, that night in Harlem and the elephant show was singing so I was like and I was like oh that's literally the date that this this scene needs to happen anywhere it's like perfect <laughs> amazing I love that yeah, I had a ton of fun researching, um, especially uh, Gladys Bentley was my favorite. Because um, I was like, ooh. And then the fact that, you know, we had the the actual name of the club where she always, you know, often performed. Um, was it, did you, so was, was, was it just random happenstance that you set this book in 1936 and then came across all of these like existing dates and whatnot? Yeah, I got, I just got, I guess I got super lucky. Um, the, the, I mean, the only reason the whole thing is, I, when I was first thinking about this book, it was going to be set in like 1950s. Mm -hmm. um, but then I was thinking about the ships and then I started to research the, the ship. Like, you know, I'm going to spend, you know, my client's going to spend most of the book on this ship. It needs to be a cool ship. Um, but then I was looking, I started looking at the cream, um, Queen Mary and like you know having her maiden voyage in 1936 and looking at the people that sailed on her in the 30s and how glamorous and I just kind of got sucked into that whole mm -hmm. atmosphere and vibe of the 1930s um so it said in so it said in 1936 because I wanted it to be in the first year of the ship sailing when she was at her peak most glamorous mm -hmm. um, and then yeah I d and you know, when I first wrote the first book, I didn't know there was going to be a second book. So then it kind of just felt like so convenient that all of these things are happening in Harlem at the time and, um, that I could include them. Yeah. I love that because I feel like, um, and I, I'm actually looking at my, I have a 1930s fashion source book um, <laughs> holding up my <laughs> tablet right here. And um, one of the things in the intro of this book is, talking about how the 1930s as a whole is a really sort of untapped time period in a lot of ways. We don't talk about it as much. We don't engage in um, as much like uh, fiction or, you know, nonfiction in the 1930s, but it's such a like interesting time period um, between two, you know, two big wars um, and a lot of strife and whatnot. Um, but it's like a, a rest period. So we see a lot of uh, what I would call like mid-level 1930s excess in these books. Um, we've got, you know, Lena in the first book, she's in this club environment a lot. And then she's on this ship with a bunch of rich people. And then in the second book, she's um, amongst maybe uh, less rich folk but then she's going to these like glamorous locations with Belle and whatnot um so yeah is it is it fun to pepper in those like sort of instances of glamorous like life lifestyle but then also bring it back into the real world with um you know Lena is always struggling right she's always struggling to um try to fit in but then not wanting to disrespect her father um yeah so sorry that's a little bit of a meandering question <laughs> <laughs> no it, it's super fun um I like always say I'm a huge fan of uh the Poirot tv series mm. David Suchet because the fashion the glamour like it's so like everything's perfect um and so I think with the first book I was trying to sort of create that on the ship the fact that you know she's sort of passing but she's managed to borrow all these fabulous dresses so she looks hot um and like it's fun to write because she is sort of acting uh I mean she is a, she is kind of an actress as well as the singer so she's but then she's like literally having to act during her life um and then in the second book Obviously, she's not acting as much. She's around more like her peers to an extent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she's staying with the Linfields who are essentially kind of middle class and she definitely isn't even middle class. She's working class. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she has those kind of, uh, you know, kind of thoughts. But 
but generally speaking she kind of feels yeah these are my people and she can be more a little bit more confident but yeah I kind of wanted there to be I mean there's certainly a contrast in the places she goes to with Val compared to the places she goes to with Will for example mm. or places that she goes to on her own yeah, she's always in, um, it feels like she's always in sort of like an uncomfortable position, um, trying to find, you know, sort of, sort of where she belongs. Um, do you, do you see her as a, like a one day actually sort of engaging in, in being a sleuth, like officially? Or do you see her more as sort of falling into these, uh, as she kind of does in the first two books, um, happening across these mysteries that she ends up having to solve? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, fair enough. <laughs> I mean, maybe. I mean, she's the person in the wrong place at every, you know, every time. So you know, she's definitely in a good position to become a sleuth and make a living from it um yeah I don't I don't know I guess if the if the singing gig completely dries up I mean she's got some experience now so yeah um and she's kind of actually I can't say that's a spoiler anyway um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but yeah potentially potentially I actually well, felt um Joey Joey is uh Belle's daughter uh, who's like 10 years old and super clever I was actually you know someone should go and write like a kids sleuth series with Joey I think that would be amazing she absolutely she would, she would definitely be better than Lena <laughs> for sure for sure um Lena would be like you're my 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 girl Friday and Joey would be like I'm solving all of these for you <laughs> um no but I love the idea that um I, I feel like this is a a this is definitely not the only sort of female-led mystery series where she's not really a sleuth. She's sort of um, falling into these mysteries. I uh, One of my favorites is Deanna Rayborn's uh, Veronica Speedwell series. And every time I try to explain it to people, I have to have to be like, well, she's a lepidopterist. <laughs> she's, she, and then I have to explain what that is. But so I just say she's a butterfly scientist. How does a, a butterfly scientist end up solving mysteries? Well, you just have to find out, you know. Um, you have so Ms. I like that idea. Muffle's not really a sleuth. She just, no. you know, she poor is half the time he's just on holiday, mm -hmm. and people just kill people around him. And which is, which you think is crazy? He's super world famous detective. Why would you kill anyone anyway? <laughs> Yeah, a you wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, so, they yeah, see his yeah, name on the guest the list. Find murder, you know, even when they're not seeing mm -hmm. Exactly. And then, it, I mean, honestly, it brings to mind the idea that I, if you think about it, the idea, um, you know, detectives and, and murder mysteries, like all of that was like so nascent and unformed as an idea anyway. You just had people who would be like, I'm a detective now, or I, you know, I'm a, a private private investigator, but no one knew what they were doing. Um, so it's it's also the sort of wonderful thing of like it's 1936. We don't have DNA evidence, you know. Um, does that make it more fun to write a mystery if you don't have the constraint of oh, I'm just going to Google this <laughs> and find out the answer? Yeah, I mean, writing someone who's not a, you know, not in the police, not, you know, when there's no, especially on the ship, because there's no, they can't just call the police and get someone in to, just for fingerprints or, or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, it makes it a lot easier for, for me. Mm -hmm. It's one less thing I have to research. Like, I'm already researching all the history and everything. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, it's quite funny because... Um, I'm doing an event here in the UK tomorrow, actually. And the moderator is an ex-policeman who now writes, and he also advises people. But his panel is basically three people who 
don't have police in their books and just avoid avoid it because you don't have to do the research and then him so i don't know how mm. it's gonna go <laughs> it's gonna be like super angry at us that we've just circumvented the law because we don't know like what what was available to the police at that time or what the laws were <laughs> Exactly. Well, it's very freeing. And then also that way, you know, if she's not officially involved in any sort of police or private investigative, um, you know, background, then that frees her up to not worry about legalities of what she's doing. And she's more trustworthy if she's able to, you know, freely say, you know, I have no, uh, you're not going to get in any trouble if you talk to me and you tell me the truth. So it's really the perfect way to, um, you know, have a character who she's she's not going to arrest you. <laughs> so you might as well tell her the truth. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, it, it, it makes for some quite interesting scenes to write mm -hmm. when she's like with, you know, someone who could be the murderer. And she's just sort of chatting, trying to chat to them casually, but then sort of looking at them going, did you did you do it? <laughs> yeah. Do you think there's also an, an added advantage to her just being female in this regard? Yeah. As far I as think, she's being underestimated. Yeah, I think I mean I think definitely um people do underestimate her. They they think well, I guess because she hasn't got a formal education past I think I think the school leaving age in the UK at the time was about 14. Mm -hmm. Um she left school as soon as she could so she she doesn't have that educational background that a lot of the people she's mixing with have you know in the first book um she's with wealthy people who've been to a certain level educated to uh, at least 18 even the women and then um in this book she's living with this you know very middle class as you know a doctor and a librarian um so yeah she feels a bit like oh like do they wonder what you know happened to me that even because she even finds out you know will in the first book is just a singer on the ship and then mm -hmm. she finds out that he was a law student at one point before things happen so it's like she's like literally the only sort of not uneducated but you know she lacks that formal education that everyone around her has so i think she you know i guess it, it, it goes back into that whole thing of her figuring out her identity but she definitely mm -hmm. feels like people treat her differently because they feel like she's not as cultured or as educated yeah yeah for sure i think it's going to end up being her superpower um it's it's just in general um a good thing to know you're being underestimated and then you know surprise everyone at the end because at the end of the day she solves both of these mysteries um which we're not going to spoil her <laughs> spoil for anybody but she has like street smarts like she's been exactly working you know she wasn't like she left school at 40 and did nothing he was working and you know looking after her dad who was like ill for a long time and do all these different things so yeah and she knows human nature too um one thing that i really enjoyed seeing was um you really do a lot of work engaging uh lena with comparing her lived experience in um, in the UK, in London in particular, and then when she's in Harlem, uh, for instance, when she's walking down the street with Will and she has this moment where she realizes that nobody's staring at us. Um, we're in Harlem. I might be passing as white, but my walking companion definitely does not pass and no one's making a big deal of it. And she thinks about how um, if she were to do the same thing in London, she would it would be noted. But at the same time in London, she also feels like she was not bothered nearly as much by like um, overt racism. So um, if you can chat to me a little bit about, because I'm really interested in the idea of, I guess like the the micro sort of social interactions that you see in the book when she's especially with when she's with Alfie in England uh, before his passing and then later with Will or with Bell um, how do you sort of keep because we're, we're really engaging like in this entire book with the specter of racism right um, 
so how do you keep it straight in your head um, when it comes to like how to sh show that without making it's not the main story, but it is totally the main story at the same time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I guess in terms of the, the balance, mm -hmm. I try to just use those situations where I think that I would I would be thinking something or noticing something. So I mean I guess like one of the differences between the UK and the US, which I think hasn't hugely changed um in terms of like the overall way that it works, is that in America I think racism tends to be more uh visible maybe, or certainly at that time with sort of the segregation and colour bars and all that kind of stuff. So they're literally being bars and clubs that will couldn't go to he could work there, but he couldn't go to them as a customer. Um we technically didn't have that in the UK, but it used to happen. Like you can find re like recorded instances of. Um, so there's an example that Lena alludes to in *The Soldier's Regret*, where she goes to the Savoy Hotel. Um, and next to the Savoy Hotel is the Savoy Theatre, like literally next door. And in the '30s, Paul Robeson, the actor, was super famous at the time, and he was living. He'd moved from the US to. Um, he was living in the UK for a while and he was acting at the Savoy Theatre and was invited by a friend to go for dinner at the hotel. He got to the hotel and they said, you can't come in because we have American guests here and they won't like it. So he was kicked out. And he was like, his name was on the theatre. <laughs> like, come and see Paul Robeson. He's amazing, but he can't eat in the, in the restaurant. So it was one of those situations where... It wasn't like an official thing in the UK, but it was always kind mm -hmm. of there. Um, and and so, yeah, so I wanted to sort of explore that difference that Lena notices where maybe she's been able to ignore things for a while because they were sort of, you know, whispered or, you know, yeah. don't, make, don't make a scene, but you can't commit, like very quiet and in, under the carpet kind of rules that exist mm -hmm. but don't exist. Whereas I think in America, it was kind of a bit more open. At least you knew. Mm -hmm. You didn't have embarrassment. You was like, well, I can't go there, so I'm not even going to try. Whereas I think in the UK, you would, tr you would think, well, why can't I go there? And they'd be like. Yeah, we don't talk about it, but this is why. Yeah. And they would never say, they'd be like, oh, we have some guests who would be a little bit upset by you. Um, but they wouldn't say why. They would just be like, mm -hmm. oh, they would say that they were full and you would see that it was like half the restaurant was empty or whatever. So yeah, it was right. always these sort of unspoken. We don't want to say that we're racist, but we but we kind of asked to just, just go away. <laughs> right, right. Well, but, but we're English about it. So we're yeah. not going to make a big deal. Out of it. Yeah. And it's, yeah, and that's kind of still how racism operates here. We don't talk about it <laughs> so much. Yeah. You still have it, but it is, yeah. Uh, it's just a little bit quieter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. gotcha um yeah i i don't want to i'm trying to think if i want to bring this up but i um yeah let's talk about it so i uh one of the things that i i treasure about this book is that um in so we have interstitial chapters where um until about midway through the book, we see somebody falls from a window. And then um, and then we so sort of catch up in this timeline. Uh, we find out who falls. And then we have the sort of falling action, so to speak, of you know finding out what happened. Um, but then interspersed in there, we have uh, Alfie 1908. And then a whole other mystery um, that I don't th think even Lena realizes that she needs to solve um, until the end. So is it um, a matter of pacing to, because that's, that's got to be the hardest thing in the world. You've got two mysteries running here, or at least two mysteries, um, and you have to pick how to reveal this second mystery that's not really even said on the page as a mystery. I'm sorry, I'm trying to talk about it, around it so much. Um, I guess I wanted to say congratulations because the second mystery is what 
completely took me by surprise. Um, and I don't have a question. I just want to say good job. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, yeah. I, I do love, I do love like a dual timeline. All my books have two timelines, whether they're you know two years apart, two weeks apart, or in this case, uh, what is it, twenty eight years apart. Yeah. Um, so, so that's always like something that I like to do. Mm -hmm. um, although I don't have it in my next book that I'm writing, but yeah. And so, the way that I normally do it is. This one was really tricky. There was a lot of editing with this one with the 1908 timeline because I kept I kept changing my mind because it's sort of Alfie's story, but it's also Jesse's story, who is her sister, that Lena doesn't know about, like has no idea this woman existed. So yeah, you're finding out why essentially you're finding out why Alfie left New York and went to London. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, I kind of wrote that whole bit separately mm -hmm. and then kind of figured where it would fit in so kind of wanting to pace it but also yeah not wanting to give away too much too early and then looking at what was going on in Lena's present day because you know you don't want her to because she's kind of looking up stuff as well to do with her father so you kind of just trying to balance what she was doing with what was happening in that timeline so yeah it was a little bit tricky <laughs> Oh, I can imagine. I I don't envy your job, but uh, it was very fun to read and to reread too. The the best thing I think about a mystery novel and one that um makes me want to recommend it to others is if I can reread it and enjoy all of the instances where I'm like, oh, that's where we got the setup. So if uh, if I wanted to impart any thing to anybody who's interested in reading this series if they haven't already is you've got to read it because um the second time around it gets even better which isn't always the case for a mystery um but yeah so I I just wanted to say well done on that one um so I, to sort of close us out a bit, um, I wanted to pivot to ask you, um, let's see, like, if you like this, then read this. So like, if you were to, so if somebody read this book and they were like, oh, I love an ocean liner mystery. Do you have any other ocean liner mysteries in particular that you would recommend? Ooh, ocean liner. Um... I mean, you know, something like Death on the Nile. I know it's not an mm -hmm. ocean, but that was the classic. That was a book that I revisited when I was, like I said, I would go to like novels written in, in the right time period so you get the language and the kind of vibes. I mean, that's that's the classic. Um, I'm trying to think of a another. There were so many out, and I, I there was too yeah. Many. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I think was a good, a really good, just general, like, because I guess it's mm -hmm. what I was trying to do is kind of do that sort of locked room mm -hmm. sort of vibe. There is one that I read um, recently called, uh, I don't know if it's out in the US, but I'm sure you could probably get hold of it. Um, uh, De Death and the Conjurer? Death and the Conjurer by Tom. Oh, yeah. Which is sort of based around, um, oh, I forgot the name of it. There's like a super classic golden age. I'm going to look it up. Um, locked room mystery. Oh, I love a locked room mystery. Yeah, Death in the Conjure has a wonderful, and then I think the second book has like a, a Ferris wheel on the covers and like that. It's It looks like a really good series. Yeah, so if you like... Um, if you like a lot room mystery, that one's really good. I read that really recently. Um, so yeah, it's based on The Hollow Man. That's the one, which was published Ooh, okay. in the 20s, which is like always put out there as like the classic original locked room mystery. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. I um have you read <laughs> I'm gonna nerd out here. Have you so I'm thinking of as far as an ocean liner mystery. Um, there's a recent series by Freya Marsk, who is an Australian author, 
And the first book is called A Marvelous Light. And then the second one is called A Restless Truth. And that one actually is set on an unnamed ocean liner. And, um, and this is like Edwardian England. Um, but it's one of my favorite new series that I've ever read. It is also a fantasy series, but um, I'm another one of those uh, locked room mystery sorts. So um, that is always my go-to. If I'm not re recommending uh, Deanna Rayborn's Veronica Speedwell series, I say check out uh, Freya Marsk's um, uh, first A Marvelous Light, then A Restless Truth, and then A Power and Bound, which is coming out in November. But that's my little plug. Yeah, I will check those out because I do love, I love fantasy. I love, um, like I love Natasha Pulley because she kind of does her mm -hmm. struggle with fantasy, which is like my, mm -hmm. my perfect, and romance as well. Um, yeah. So historical fantasy romance, it's like the perfect combination, yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, anything Absolutely. I, recommend, I would recommend. Okay, good. Good to know. And um, yeah, I... That there's so many. Ashley Weaver has a wonderful series. I think the protagonist is Electra McDonnell. Um, I really loved that one as well. I can't wait to read more. Um, but you know, ask an author or a bookseller, and we'll give you five million uh, titles <laughs> and um, and names and whatnot. So we could go on forever. Uh, Louise, thank you so much for talking to me today. I uh, love this series so much, and I. Um, hope to hear more from you as far as the series goes but also in general can't wait to read your next book um thank you so much for being here everybody we would not have a bookstore without you and we'll see you at the next one Bye bye <laughs>